We're told that we live in exceptional political times, uh, times that include emotional appeals to the values of the West and to Western civilization. But fears for the decline of the West or claims that Western values are under threat and need protection are not exceptional. They have a history. The US is sort of leading the world at the moment in one thing, and that is being in a state of existential crisis over its political future after the election of Donald Trump. The idea of excluding or building walls or saying that there are particular ethnicities, nationalities, religions that are not able to be part of the American project has a very long history. The notion of Western civilization has come back into political debate after the election of Trump in a big way, both from his supporters and also, of course, from his Opponent. What are they actually arguing is the cause of the problems? For both of them, so whether they're supportive or not of Trump, it is that effectively there has been a breakdown of dominant consensus over the legacy of the 18th century and over the legacy of the founding of the American Republic. They're saying there used to be a nice consensus, now we're an atomized, fractured citizenry. Those problems and questions and debates are not new. They're certainly not 21st century phenomena. They're actually repeating and recurring features of American political development right from the beginning. I don't think much that's edifying or illuminating comes out of the kind of arguments that um, Jonathan is talking about in contemporary American politics. Um, and it would be good to have people thinking about different kinds of vocabulary, different kinds of language they can use to articulate their, um, to articulate their disagreements. One of the things that's very interesting about the, the word civilization or the original concept of civilization is that it isn't quite what a lot of people think that it would be, that um, it's not a label that gets slapped onto European society to celebrate it, quite the contrary. There's a number of different arguments around in the 1750s about why the, the, the polite commercial societies of the 18th century may be on a trajectory towards uh, a complete social smash-up. And Mirabeau coins this word civilization in order to try and explain what modern French society, modern European commercial society is lacking. People have this idea that the, uh, the theories of the Enlightenment are uh, rationalist, optimistic, progressive, and so on. Um, but actually, if you look at the main philosophies that were uh, adumbrated, um, they're skeptical and they're and they, they, they often want to dethrone the role of reason. David Hume or Adam Smith, who produce theories of moral sentiments. Um, Rousseau argues for the centrality of understanding the passions, in particular the different varieties of self-love that we have for understanding uh, modern societies. And even someone like Immanuel Kant, who's often held up as the symbol of um, 18th century rationalism, we shouldn't forget that his books are all called The Critique of Reason. You know, that's why we're here to talk about these terms, because they have explanatory power and they have value to us as we try and interpret the world. But, yeah, as I said, sort of the, the, the sort of figures that have been using these terms in sort of political debates have basically infused them with the sense that there is a correct, right, and hopefully they would say consensual way through a thicket of societal complications that I think cannot be, they can't, they can't be a consensual way through using terms like the West or civilization. I come from Poland. Uh, I was um, going to high school there, and the first time you encounter the Enlightenment is in high school. And you encounter it in a very powerful way because some of you may know, maybe you all know, that in 1795 Poland or Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth disappears from the map of Europe for 100 some years. And the reason for that you learn at school is that there was not enough um, enlightenment in a way. So you, you first you get this kind of very positive message that enlightenment is a great thing and this is something that 
well, came too late. And, and then um, I go to um, university and I study sociology and philosophy in Krakow. Um, and again, you learn more or less that the Enlightenment is, well, a specific thing, something basically positive, because I study the university, which is a very powerful tradition of uh, logic. And then you learn a lot, we've learned a lot about Marx, and, and you, you are beginning to think that, you know, Marx is in the Enlightenment gone mad, completely mad, and that, that does awful things. Then I go to New York and I study anthropology of Columbia, and I enter the graduate school at the time where the main thing you do is the bashing Enlightenment, as much as you can in the name of all kind of, you know, the Enlightenment is seen as the system of thought that is behind the uh, cultural imperialism of the West. All of those political and intellectual currents that have really grown up over the last 60, 70 years, but they were developing all the way through the American Republic from um, suffrage movements in the 19th century through to the challenge to slavery. All of those have challenged this idea that there is a consensual, agreed vision of what the United States is. You can't have a 21st century a society based principally on 18th century written constitutional values alone. This moment of doubt, which I went through in graduate school, where the, the Enlightenment and its values were mostly seen, mostly not exclusively, as, as the f intellectual foundation of cultural imperialism. Um, I, I guess now we, we need to start recovering those ideas uh, of the Enlightenment because without them, I, I am not sure uh, how to fight the, the, this, this wave of unreason that, that we all um, talk about.